Okay, so I think recording has started. You guys can hear me properly. Or... Okay, and you can also see the screen, right? Okay, cool. So uh, let's begin week three lecture content. So uh, before concluding last week's uh, discussion session, uh, I had uh, floated a problem and assignment take home kind of a problem for the multi arm bandit problem. Maybe we can start by looking at uh, that first, discuss the solution. If you have any doubts, I'm happy to help you out. So I hope you guys have tried it out. If not, uh, we'll try it out for, let's say, the first half an hour of the session. So I am sharing my screen. Let me know if you can see my screen. Can you see this week two tutorial dot IPYNB? Okay, so I'm assuming you can see it. So I have shared this uh, link on the chat. You can open it simultaneously. Uh, I want you to go here save a copy and then you can start editing it okay so i'll just do a quick recap uh, those who uh, couldn't uh, attend last time so we wanted to uh, look at the implementation for the multi arm bandit problem and we wanted to implement the epsilon greedy and probably the softmax distribution and see how the behavior looks like from an implementation perspective okay so we started by defining what is the multi arm bandit problem I think it's week three now. By now, we are uh, very much familiar by what we mean by a multi arm bandit problem. So it's a slot machine kind of a problem where each arm pull will give me some immediate reward. And my aim or my objective is to maximize this uh, reward function over a period of time. Okay. So, first, we import uh, the libraries. This is done. Then, first, uh, first of all, we want to uh, look, estimate some uh, and visualize. Okay. Yeah. So we want to visualize uh, some probability distribution functions. So we, uh, I start set up some random seed and then I define the parameters for some distributions. Okay. So these parameters that I've taken are random. So for the Gaussian distribution, I'm randomly selecting. Uh, two mu and two sigma. So based on that, I have two version distribution. Then for the uniform distribution, I am signifying the low and the high. The two arms they are following a uniform distribution kind of a reward. Then there is there are two arms following the Poisson distribution, for which there is the lambda parameterization, and for the beta parameterization there is the a and the b term. Okay, and uh, here this true means list contains the true value for all these distributions. So for the Gaussian distribution, it's the mean. For the uniform distribution, it's uh, high plus low by two. For the Poisson, it's the lambda itself. And for beta, it's A by A plus B. So these are all uh, known means for this known, well-known uh, well uh, probability distribution functions. So here, the numbers are chosen arbitrarily. They have no particular significance. And for real-world problems, this true means will not be available. Since we know the parameter parameters as well as distributions, we can analytically calculate the true means. Okay, this is only for a sake of exercise. I hope. Uh, okay, it's rec being recorded. Okay, fine. Now this function is uh, for this function basically does the arm pulling for me. Okay, so I give it uh, which arm I want to pull, and it actually performs that pull and gives returns me a reward. Okay. So if um, I have pulled a zero one, which is the Gaussian Gaussian bandit that I pulled, then I get a reward, which is sampled from the Gaussian distribution, from the normal distribution. And for that particular uh, arm, I get the mu and the sigma. And based on that, I get uh, a reward. For uh, the uniform distribution, it's np.random.uniform. For Poisson distribution, I'm sampling from Poisson distribution based on the parameters that I've already set in the above cell. Okay. Then there is the beta distribution. So this is a function. What we are doing is first just pulling each arm, say around 1,000 times to get enough samples for plotting and estimation. 
So I have defined a reward, which is eight comma one thousand. So each arm I'm pulling one thousand times, and I'm storing the reward for each arm that I pull. So it's like kind of a brute force kind of a mechanism. Okay. So I'm doing some brute force kind of a arm pulling. So now that we have come, uh, collected enough samples, so let's say I don't do 1,000, I do 10,000. Okay, so let me change this. It's some some arbitrary big number that I need. Okay, so I do it for 10,000, and now I want to calculate the estimated mean and then compare it with the true mean. Okay, so if I run this, so I get a tabular form. This is the actual true. This is the true mean for all the arms, and this is the estimated mean. And if I want to plot it, so this is a uh, cell for plotting each uh, of these arms. So this is how it looks visually. Okay, so this is the two Gaussian distribution. There, uh, the red uh, line indicates the uh, estimated mean, and the green line tells me the true mean. So more number of samples means that I'm closer and closer to the uh, true mean. Okay. So here there is a difference, but the difference is uh, small in number. Maybe I should take more number of samples. So let's say instead of thousand, I take uh, a million, million ampoule. Okay, so let's say I do that here and also here. Okay. Okay. Five zeros, it's like a hundred thousand ampoule. So we were close, but not very close back then. But now if I increase the number of armfuls that I do, yeah. Now I think we have a better uh, representation. So see the uh, green and the red line are almost superimposed. Like the more number of samples that I take, I am like closer and closer to achieving or estimating the true mean. So this is uh, simply the law of large numbers that we study in statistics. This is just a visual representation of all those things. OK, so far, so clear. So this is uh, uh, just to show example of four common types of tractable distributions, namely the Gaussian, uniform, Poisson, and the beta, each distribution having two arms. And then while it is incredibly uh, useful to know the underlying distribution, but more often than not, in real world problems, we don't have access to those true means. OK, so we only can uh, do more number of samples and make an assumption that given uh, more number of samples, I am expected to uh, reach the true mean. OK, so uh, now that was like a brute force kind of an approach. So I just take one arm, I pull it one million times, and then expect to get the reward and so on. But uh, that's where we need something like RL, because we want to minimize the number of samples that we do but also determine the best arm, right? So with fewer samples, I want to uh, determine which is the optimal arm. Because let's say in real life situation, the arm pull, each action or each arm pull has some associated cost with it. You require some amount of energy for uh, taking some kind of an action. So that makes sense in that sense to minimize the number of arm pulls. So uh, how do we do that? For the bandit problem, we had uh, discussed like, two algorithms. One was the epsilon greedy algorithm. And the second one was a soft max algorithm. We had also discussed the strengths and the weaknesses of both these approaches. So quickly, can anyone tell me like what exactly is the epsilon greedy algorithm? And what is the soft max algorithm? And how does it compare with each other? Anyone? No? So uh, epsilon greedy is used for uh, maintaining the exploration and exploitation uh, 
ratio. So, like with probability okay. epsilon, we take a random action, and okay. probability one minus epsilon, we take a mm -hmm. uh, you know max. If yeah, cool. Two cool. Values. Yeah. So why do we need then soft max if we have epsilon greedy? And why do we need something like UCB? Any idea why why we do that? Uh, no, sir. But, but. So what happens in softmax is you have uh, e to the power minus q upon beta divided by sum of e to the power minus q by beta. You remember this formula, right? Yes. For softmax. So uh, uh, what happens is in epsilon greedy for the uh, action that you are sampling, the random action that you sample, uh, that exploration part is a uh, sort of uh, random do you understand that yes that action is random in exploration hmm. yes. it is it is random okay but sometimes it might happen that some arms i have established in two three samples that this is necessarily bad i don't want to waste time pulling that again but in epsilon greedy it might happen that i might end up pulling that because it's select randomly because that's how exploration is right there is some randomness component when we do this exploration. But what happens in softmax is I'm uh, weighing the relative strength of each action. When I do exponential uh, exponential of q, q divided by sum of exponential of q, I'm kind of making a probabilistic weightage of each action, right? So it's like saying if some action is very bad, it will uh, naturally have a lower probability of getting selected. As compared to some other arm which has a higher uh, higher probability. Okay, so we are sort of removing the uh, randomness or the uncertainty that we had in in the exploration in the epsilon greedy strategy. Okay, so both these approaches still fairly work well, even uh, though epsilon greedy has some limitations. It's still very popular for the bandit problem. Secondly, uh, we have something known as the uh, UCB algorithm, right? So the upper confidence bound algorithm that also does similar things. We remove the epsilon part. We do QA plus square root of two log n by capital N. Okay. So that also uh, takes into account the confidence with which a certain arm is selected. So this is a, like the basic difference. So now I just want to try and implement the epsilon gradient softmax on the Gaussian bandit. So <clears throat> I've taken my number of arms to be five. So this is uh, my task one is to implement the epsilon greedy, right? So here I have taken all my arms to be Gaussian. In the earlier example, I had taken different different uh, reward distributions for each arm. Now in this case, I am what I'm doing is uh, stating that each arm follows some Gaussian distribution. And for that, uh, the muse for each arm is uh, something that uh, will be uh, given by the environment and each of them have the same same standard deviation which is one okay so this is the full mab function now this was the epsilon greedy part this is where i had uh, kept uh, spaces for you guys to fill in so if you haven't maybe we can start filling it you can help me out okay so this is the epsilon greedy algorithm first what i do is I initialize small q, which is the number of zeros, which is total number of arms. OK, so my num arms is 5. I gave some muse. Epsilon is the epsilon parameter. So this uh, small q basically maintains the q estimates, which is initialized at 0. I can initialize it to any number. OK, I need not always necessarily uh, initialize my uh, q estimate to be 0. but uh, I have to start with something, right? So I start with zero. So you can always bias it in uh, to some other random number uh, to start off the uh, estimate with. Sometimes it might help for when we bias the initial Q value initialization. Then this is the time sampled uh, uh, parameter. So it keeps a track of the number of times each arm has been pulled. So initialize this to be zero. So NP dot zero is number of arms. Then I have a list of five list to store the sequence of the q estimate for each arm which will be useful to plot the convergence so this q of all arms over time is something where i'm uh, storing a list 
containing the list of all the arms that have pulled so far. So this is useful for plotting purposes, not for the epsilon greedy. Then there is a empty list for the rewards. There's a list for the regret list. So this is the code for P in range 2000. That means for 2000 time steps, I will do something. So this is the uh, epsilon greedy part. Okay. So first I want to epsilon greedy pick an arm. So I'll say that my arm is equal to what could it be? So I can say my arm is equal to argmax of this if np dot random dot rand is greater than epsilon else. I do np dot random dot rand in num arms. This line is clear. Yes, sir. So I have done argmax of q if I sample a random number between zero and one. If that number is greater than epsilon, I do argmax. If that number is less than, so I do uh, a random arm uh, selection. So this is clear, right? This np dot random dot rand part how this is done. I'm selecting a random number between 0 and 1. If that number is greater than epsilon, it's fine. If it's less than epsilon, I do uh, the exploration. OK, what here? So whatever arm that I sampled, I want to update that, right? So. So this is the arm that I sampled. I'm just taking that index index and doing plus plus equal to one. Next up, I want to have the reward, which is my pull MAB. So this is the pull MAB function. This gives me the reward, right? So I need to give the index for the arm. So my arm is equal to arm and my muse is equal to muse. Muse is the estimated mean right so that what we have in the beginning this is something that the uh, environment is giving this news i'm just putting it as it is let me know if you have any doubts okay i'm deliberately going slow okay this is done next i want to do a stochastic averaging which is online update of the q estimate which is qr plus equal to reward Okay, so far so good. This is also clear. I just did the update. Okay, so my Q arm is basically Q arm plus my reward minus Q arm divided by the total number of times that I have sampled that particular arm. And now I want to store it with it within the list of lists. So I do Q oh, of all arms over time. So for that, or rather I should do for i in range num arms. So this is a for loop. So here I am storing all the q values. Okay. And after this is done, I just comment this line and I hope my code works. Okay. So what it should return me is my Q rewards and Q of all arms over time. And this is where 
hopefully this should run because here i am <coughs> running the epsilon greedy for three different values of epsilon so i have epsilon equal to zero i have epsilon 0 0.01 which is one person exploration and this is 10 person exploration so let's see okay so this is running so there is no error so far in the code and uh, next uh, maybe see how the plotting function looks like okay So showing for arm zero, it is more or less converging to the actual true, true estimate. But the other arms, I'm not so sure what's the issue. Okay, maybe we'll uh, Okay, so we have all the Q1s, all Q2s and QQS. So here for uh, my epsilon equal to zero, I have plotted all Q1s. So for epsilon equal to 0 0.01, I just copy this and change it to all Q2s. And uh, okay. Okay, so you see it gives me something. So this this is how the yellow arm which is arm three this is the actual true value so it started off from here and eventually it converges on this line same with the red curve it's converging uh, the blue curve has some minor offset the green and the pink also are converging so since this is done for only 2000 time steps maybe if i increase it further let's say we do it for 6000 time steps Okay, this doesn't show anything for some reason. Some uh, some better behavior is uh, obviously there, but yeah, see, there's still improvement that is uh, required. Maybe you can play around with this later on. You can try changing the uh, epsilon quantity, the number of time steps you want to train it for, and lastly. We see it for epsilon equal to point 0.1. Ha, huh, see. So you see with increase in epsilon, I am getting better and better convergence. So this is something that we can observe clearly, right? This is for epsilon zero. This is for epsilon point one. Maybe, yeah, change the label. And this is for epsilon, sorry, this is for 0 0.01, right? And this is for epsilon point one. So you see what happened is, while my epsilon equal to zero gave me very subpar performance, when I slowly increase the epsilon, which is I'm exploring 1% of the time, but exploiting 99% of the time, I got some result, but still there were some offsets left because 
my arm is more or less behaving greedily 99% of the time. But the moment I increase to, let's say, 0.1, which is 10% exploration, I surprisingly get very good results. Now, what should happen if I make it 0.2? Any idea? First, I have to plot that. So I say something like Q4, and here I make it 0.2. Okay, so this is another epsilon greedy that I'm running. If I run this, and again I run the plotter function. See, the performance is improving uh, as we slowly and slowly increase the exploration parameter. Now tell me what happens if I, so like if I keep on increasing till when I go to epsilon 0.3, epsilon 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, I should keep on getting better and better results, right? So the result might degrade if you're exploring too, uh, exploring too much. Mm -hmm. So like if so uh, if we have a high value of epsilon if we start with a high value of epsilon then we decrease mm -hmm. then uh -huh. it will work so that uh, it means you're saying if i keep epsilon to be 0 0.999 i might get performance similar to if i keep epsilon to be 0. Point, uh, epsilon as 0 i mean mm -hmm. uh, yes. similar as in uh, similarly bad similarly worse yes okay so uh, with the help of this, I hope you realize that there is some sweet spot of exploration that we can do in order to improve the performance of the of the bandit algorithm. So that sweet spot lies somewhere between 0 0.1 up till 0 0.4 and maybe 0 0.5. Okay. Beyond that, again, we start uh, seeing some uh, degradation in the performance. So, so far, so good. So maybe we can maybe see. Uh, let me see. Uh, just a sec. Maybe I have something already. Okay. So here, this is, I think, uh, I have already solved the uh, for the solutions for this problem. So we uh, saw similar results for the epsilon point one. Now, what we want to do is maybe try and see uh, how uh, the average behavior of the epsilon greedy looks like. Okay, so I just quickly need to run from here. Okay, start here. I go down running each cell till I reach <laughs> here. We have to might have to wait for some time. Okay, so this is the plot for 0 0.01. This is the plot for 0 0.1. So now we want to see the average behavior for the epsilon greedy algorithm, which is average over independent runs. So what we do is when we evaluate the average behavior of the algorithm, we are trying to basically average it over several runs of the experiment, similar to the earlier. So it means for one episode, I do the sampling from time step one till time step 6,000, which we, which I did earlier. Okay. That is one episode. That means I, uh, pull 2000, uh, pull, one of the arm for a total of 6,000 time steps. After 6,000 time steps is done, I again restart and I do it again. Okay. So I do this multiple times and then I average uh, average over uh, several independent runs. And here the uh, uh, generated true means are different for each independent run. So for the first run, each uh, bandit has some underlying uh, 
Q star A value. When I reset that, when I again come to time t equal to zero, that uh, thing might be different. The underlying arm, I again have to estimate it. When I reset it, I keep on doing that again and again. Okay. So once I do that, so I'm doing it for one thousand runs. Okay. So one run contains six thousand samples, and I'm doing it for one thousand number of times. And uh, when I do that. So this is the code for that. Okay, I'm just uh, taking all this and averaging with time. So this might take some time because there are one thousand number of arm pulls that is being done. Okay, if you want, I can share this with you. Meanwhile. If you have any questions, meanwhile, please feel free to ask. I think this will take some time, or maybe thousand was not a good idea. Maybe I should make it one hundred. Okay, maybe let it run. It's fine. I already have the results here. So this is the plot. This is how the performance looks like. This is the average reward. This is the number of steps. So this number of steps is two thousand. This is how epsilon zero behaves. This is the Average true reward. This is how epsilon zero point zero one behaves, and this is how epsilon zero point one behaves. Okay, so you see that there is a clear increase or improvement in the performance while we are tuning the epsilon parameter. Okay, so any idea why here the orange curve is showing better than the green curve, while green is zero point one and orange is zero point zero one? any explanation for that or is it some stochastic behavior if i run it again i might i get i don't get it again maybe let's try it okay see similar any idea why or the green curve dominates in the beginning but later on somehow the orange curve is the better better performer so one one way we can think about it is that maybe after a certain number of time that uh, 0.1 exploration is too much okay let's say after 1000 time steps i have figured out more or less the optimal arm i now don't want to do uh, a random exploration so the lesser exploration i do is better so with time i want to give more priority to my exploitation so that's why this 0.01 sort of performs better so this also this uh, performance or this behavior also tells me that with time i should also try to tune my epsilon parameter so initially epsilon 0.1 very good after some time epsilon 0.01 uh, amazing so maybe somewhere i should try to cool down the epsilon i start with epsilon 0.1 i start decreasing it slowly and slowly until i reach to epsilon 0.01 so this is known as uh, cooling off of the uh, exploration parameter so this sort of gives a generalized behavior over the longer run okay otherwise even though i have i know the optimal arm but still 10 or 20% of the time i'm still doing that uh, exploration okay similarly this is a function to implement the softmax algorithm the code is already here you might uh, check it out later i have shared the link Okay, this is how the performance looks like for epsilon greedy. Sorry, for softmax. again it is taking time because i am directly evaluating the average behavior i am not doing the single run thing 
so i'm testing it for 1000 runs okay. any idea what is beta here in epsilon greedy anyone So my beta looks like this. Okay, so this is the epsilon greedy, which is, sorry, this is my soft max. So my beta is basically Q by temp parameter, right? So I do NP dot EXP, oh, uh, which is Q over temp. So this temp is basically the beta parameter. This is a temperature tuning parameter. So the higher uh, temperature I have, more uh, the higher the value of beta, that means I am uh, more or less uh, inclined to do a uniform sampling of the arm. The better, uh, the smaller I cool down beta, I am more and more biased to select the optimal arm, which is I am basically trying to increase or decrease the sensitivity of uh, this uh, Q value updation. Okay. And uh, yeah, so this is how the softmax uh, average reward looks over time for varying temperatures so this tells me that uh, having beta to be 0 0.01 or beta to be 0 0.1 gives me much better performance as compared to having beta equal to 5 because beta equal to 5 means i am more inclined to select a random action as compared to the optimal action so this beta parameter also sort of tunes the exploration and exploitation part in in the softmax algorithm so far so good you have any doubts you want me to explain how this beta works or okay if not we can start with the content of week three. Okay. So you guys can see my screen, right? Okay. So we start off week three content with something called as policy search. Okay. I just highlight this. Okay. So, so far, what we have been looking at is uh, a method to uh, maximize the value function method. Okay. So, whatever we have, we have dealt with so far so far we have looked at epsilon greedy we have looked at softmax we have look, looked at ucb1 all of these methods try to look at the argmax of this q value in in some sense okay if it's epsilon greedy, then there is all, also a random action part. If there is UCB, there is this plus uh, tool on in by NJ term for UCB algorithm. And uh, for softmax, it's different. But eventually, what we are looking at is if I generalize it, these are all value function based methods so i'm trying to estimate the arm which has the optimal q value and now based on that i try to 
get um, estimate this qt value which should be closer and closer to my q star of a q star of a value and after that all i need to do is i define a policy pi based on this arg max of q of a right this is uh, generally what we are trying to do based we are trying to select that arm or maybe i should say this is okay this is my arm a and so i based on this arg max value i might have my arm a1 a2 a3 dot 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 till arm an okay so if my episode it for episode is for le, uh, time length n so i have a bunch of actions that i'm following and this action is something which is defined under the policy pi so this tells me <coughs> the mapping uh or rather that mapping term doesn't come in before i introduce the notion of a state but this is like a policy that i'm following so in first time step i pull arm a1 in second time step i pull arm a2 and so on and uh, this is what we are doing so far so the whole crux is we are still trying to maximize the value function right by estimating estimating q fa okay so far so good but uh, it turns out there are also methods wherein we don't touch uh, the value value uh, function space at all rather we directly deal with the policy space okay so a policy is uh, basically can be defined as the probability that i select action a at time t okay you can think of it as some probability mapping cool so for my ucb algorithm this was oh uh, sorry for my epsilon greedy this looked like arg my epsilon greedy this looked like arg max of a q of a if epsilon greater than or if some some random number is greater than epsilon otherwise it was uniform of a if my random number was smaller than epsilon right so this is the policy for the epsilon greedy for softmax For softmax, uh, this is like exp q of a by beta divided by sum of all the b's exponential of q of b by beta. Okay, this is the softmax method. okay so now for for a simple example uh for a simple uh we'll take a very simplistic example so we are dealing with something known as binary bandits okay so what happens in the binary bandit is that my reward value r of t can only take two values which is zero or one okay 
I have only two values that uh, for which I can get a reward, which is either a value of zero or a value of one, depending on what actions I select. Okay, so far so good. Now we say if my RT is one, that is, if I select my reward to be one, then my policy update. So note that here I'm not updating the value function. I'm directly updating the policy. So my pi t plus 180 is equal to my pi t 80 plus alpha times 1 minus pi t 80. <coughs> OK. Any idea where this came from? This equation I wrote, some random equation I wrote. Any idea how this came from? I just wrote something, but you might be wondering, right? How did this come from? So if you remember last class, we started with stochastic averaging, right? So for stochastic averaging, we had this Q of T plus one was Q of T plus one by one plus N uh, RT minus QT, some equation we had for stochastic averaging. If you remember last lecture. And we had also seen how we derived this part. We had derived this formulation. OK, so based on that, I had. Uh, I did some generalization and had said that. This kind of stochastic averaging always follows. This methodology, which is. My new estimate is nothing but my old estimate. Plus step size. times target minus old estimate. I hope you guys remember this formula. If not, please make a note of this again. I should highlight this. This is always the case for any sort of stochastic or online averaging that we do. My new estimate will always be old estimate plus some step size target minus the old estimate, right? So here RT is equal to one. This is my target. So here I've kept it to be one. My old estimate is pi t of 80. And this is uh, the old estimate. Alpha is my step size parameter. <laughs> and based on that, I have defined a formulation for my linear band for my binary binding problem. If I have reward of one and I have reward of zero based on that, this is how my policy update looks like. Similarly, similarly, if I take RT is equal to zero. Okay, now my target is zero. Okay, be careful with this. So this is how the policy update changes. Notice all I have done in both this part is that I've just flipped this equation based on the target that I have. And I have different uh, step size parameter. For the first case, my step size parameter is 
alpha for my second case my step size parameter is beta okay now based on this we can define some properties maybe i define it here itself okay if my alpha is equal to beta this is something known as lrp it stands for linear reward penalty that means for good action i give it uh, a reward and for bad action i give it a penalty which is a linear in relationship if my alpha is much much greater than beta that means it's linear l epsilon p so linearly i give it a reward when it does something good and when it does something bad i don't give it a very high penalty my penalty is epsilon in nature so i give it a very small penalty okay similarly if my beta is zero that means all i'm doing is i'm not penalizing it for any bad action i'm only rewarding it for good action so this is a uh, linear reward in action okay so based on this thing uh, based on the binary bandit problem i can define three different types of binary bandits one is lrp one is l r epsilon p one is l r i okay so far so good you guys are still with me a, a couple of questions sure, sure. um when you say a binary bandit <clears throat> does mm -hmm. it mean it has two actions or it has one actions it has two rewards zero two. and one no, but how many actions are there actions can be multiple the uh, actions depend on the number of bandits that i have it, uh, it so you're saying uh, i can have k arms okay so uh, notice here if rt is equal to 1 if that particular arm is selected if i select arm at i get a reward which is positive reward okay yes and for all other arms a prime which is not equal to at i get this reward update so it is independent of the number of actions that i have so you are update, updating the probability of a specific action only in either case i am updating the probability of that particular action which uh, yes yes that's true that's true right so yeah. your second statement is a dash is not equal to at that is any other action but at yes okay understood and when you uh, so now 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 i understand that because i had a confusion i thought you only uh -huh. have two actions but no, I, no, no. now i understand this thanks okay so next up this was like a very uh, naive example a binary bandit problem in real life applications you might more or less not have such kind of a binary reward okay so to uh, take it a step further to make it more general in nature for the policy search problem we uh, now have to come up with something more general which is known as the policy gradient method okay yeah i like this okay so what happens in the policy gradient method so first thing i'm doing is i'm saying that my policy is kind of parameterized or dependent on set of parameters okay so i'll say my policy pi is defined by a set of parameter which is theta so this is a parameterized policy so if you remember in the code i showed before when we did the first example which is the simple exercise where i had defined the gaussian uniform 
uh, the Poisson and the beta distribution. You see, for uh, defining a Gaussian distribution, I need not always uh, define it explicitly. Okay, I just need two parameters. One is the mu, one is the sigma. If I have both, I know the entire Gaussian distribution. Correct. Similarly, for a uniform distribution, I only need to know my lower and the uh, high upper limit. And based on that, I have I parameterize my full distribution based on these two parameters. So I only need to control this uh, low and the high value for Gaussian. I need to control the mu and the sigma value. Similarly, in the policy gradient method, my policy pi is parameterized by a set of parameter, which we, I'll call it as theta. So based on the tuning of the theta parameter, all I'm doing is I'm uh, defining how my policy distribution changes over time. Okay, so far so good. Now the question is, how exactly do you parameterize it? That's the question, right? How exactly to figure out these thetas? So two methods that professor mentioned, one is something known as a preference based method. So it's like I heuristically set some preferences for each arm. So let's say arm one, I uh, give it some preference for arm two, I give it some preference. It's some sort of a heuristic kind of a uh, method in which uh, I can try to parameterize my policy. Secondly, it could be weights of a neural network. So if I, when we eventually go to deep RL, then we want this theta parameters to be approximated by some neural network. Okay. So this is again another way to parameterize my policy. So if I uh, learn the uh, weights of the neural network, that uh, basically it defines a, para a parameterized policy. I, all I need to do is uh, do a feed forward propagation. I get my state to action mapping. Okay. So this is, uh, these are two metrics. Now, uh, once I have my policy pi, I need to look for some evaluation metric for my pi of theta, right? Which is my policy th theta, right? So this evaluation matrix is something we'll call as eta. So this eta of theta measures, it measures uh, the goodness of a particular parameters, right? So, so far, what could be one way to evaluate a policy? Theta, any idea? Reward, reward function. Could be a reward function, but is it uh, exact? Uh, so you're saying this is R of T. You think this is fine? No, no. I mean, you are uh, going in the right direction. This? Yes, expectation. Okay, so I don't deal with reward because reward is something which is Im immediate. Okay, and also since we are dealing with a stochastic world, uh, we need to do some number of arm pulling before we converge to the true reward. Okay, so this is a uh, performance uh, measure or an evaluation metric. <coughs> now all I'm doing is I'm trying to open this expectation. So if you have done week zero lecture, so. Can someone tell me how I op how I can open my expectation? So okay, I'll just write it maybe. Any doubt? Any confusion here? So what I'm trying to tell is when I'm computing the expectation, 
it is basically the sum of all the q values for all of the possible arms and multiplied it with the probability of me selecting that arm so it's the true mean value of arm a prime and the probability of me as a human operator selecting that particular arm so this is how the expectation rollout looks like so we should name it as some equation one and color code it for future reference right okay we might have to come back to this okay so note again i'll again be using this equation okay so my new estimate is my old estimate plus step size times target minus old estimate so if i use it again i get theta is theta plus alpha times eta of theta so i am not updating the policy now all i am doing is updating the theta because if i have theta i have the entire policy okay and this is how the policy update for theta looks like so i have my new estimate which is theta t plus 1 i have my old estimate which is the original theta step size parameter alpha and the error term is basically uh, now the performance metric over here okay so it's like saying if i if i make a plot of theta versus eta of theta which is my expected reward and let's say the curve looks something like this so i initially start off with some theta 0 okay in the next update i would try to move in the positive direction of the gradient okay i there should be a gradient term here right sorry i missed this gradient term here this is gradient of eta of theta now it makes sense like right? to the original equation it's the error term which is the gradient step size times the gradient of this parameter so all i'm trying to do is i want to keep moving in the direction of the positive gradient so this is my theta one so this is the direction of the positive gradient i move one step over here in the next update i move by some uh step alpha in this particular direction and i get theta 2 and so on so this is something known as stochastic gradient ascent okay if you have uh if you have uh studied uh, about deep learning before so you know something known as stochastic gradient descent right so whenever we want to try to or or a machine learning if you have done any machine learning course you might know something known as stochastic gradient descent so whenever we have a type of a convex function uh, we always try to move in the negative direction of the gradient so as to converge to the uh, or so as to uh, minimize the losses okay here i am trying to maximize uh, the evaluation metric right so this uh, my goal is i want to maximize my eta of theta so that's why uh, i would always try to move in the direction of the positive gradient okay so here i know theta i know alpha what i don't know is eta of theta so again look back over here so here eta of theta is something that is unknown to me can you tell me why because of this this term over here this is q star of a this is always almost always never available to us in real life the true mean is never given to us we are always trying to do an estimate of it right 
so i can say that i don't know what is my q star of a prime so that uh, makes my computation of my gradient which is this particular value difficult for me right so let's see how how we can uh, do some neat uh, math trick around to find out delta of uh, eta theta right So what I've done is I had taken eta uh, parameter, which I had defined uh, in the previous slide. I have just applied the gradient operator. So since my Q star of A has no theta dependence, that's why these come outside the gradient. So my gradient is only being operated on the policy pi because this policy pi has a theta dependence over here, as you can see. <laughs> okay, so this is something that we want to compute. So We'll do one simple thing. So, small mathematical trip trick known as important sampling. So, I'll take the equation as is, and I multiply and divide by pi of a prime theta. Okay, I can do that, or I can multiply and divide by the same quantity, as long as my pi of a theta is greater than zero. Okay, as long as this condition holds true, I can always multiply and divide. Okay, maybe not greater than. Should be no non-zero, not equal to zero. Okay. As long as this condition is satisfied, I can always multiply and divide these two parameters. So now, if I club this quantity together, so what it ends up giving me is my expectation conditioned over pi of Q star A prime delta theta. Pi a prime theta divided by pi of a prime theta. So far, so good. You guys understand how I came from here to here. Based on this definition, okay. So here, this is e of R T. So I have my Q star of a is nothing but my e of R T, right? So my expectation. Is nothing but the uh, parameter which uh, or the random variable for which I am trying to find out the expectation times the underlying probability distribution. So here we still have the underlying probability distribution, which is pi a prime theta. So this is condition over uh, the distribution pi, and I want to find out the expectation of this variable over here. Okay. <laughs> now again, I still have this Q. Q star a prime quantity over here, right? I still have this uh, Q star a prime uh, quantity over here. See, the reason I multiply and divide it is because I again want to bring it to the uh, expectation form. Because as long as my uh, gradient is in the form of expectation, what I can do is I can draw samples, right? I can draw some number of samples and eventually get some. Crude estimate of my uh, gradient of my eta function. Okay, so this can be written as one by n
So notice what I have done here is I want to find out an estimate of this Q star A prime because I know my policy. Uh, I know this quantity over here. All I want is uh, some estimate of this Q star A prime. So that's why all I'm doing is drawing a random sample of uh, the arm that I pull. I get the reward and I compute this quantity. Okay, so this is more or less some sort of an approximation for my uh, a gradient part. So once I have this, I can plug it over here, over uh, this equation. Okay, I should color this. So I plug it in this equation and then I can compute the uh, theta update. Okay. But uh, notice uh, the caveat over here. This operation can only be done in batches. Okay. So this is a major, major caveat. That means that means for one update, one time step update of the theta parameter, I might have to sample the arm more or less n number of times, and that n needs to be very large. So maybe a thousand number of samples I pull, only then I can get some estimate of the gradient and so on. Okay. So this is more or less a batch updation, and this is a very cumbersome process in itself. Whenever I am trying to do a policy uh, search kind of a method or a policy gradient kind of a method, I am trying to uh, learn the policy directly. So for learning the policy, I am trying to learn its uh, parameterized theta function. And for one update of the theta parameter, I might have to take n number of samples. And this updation keeps on going in a batchwise fashion. OK. Now the question is, can we do something better? Is it possible by not doing it in a batchwise sense, we do it in an incremental sense? OK. So this is some limitation of this policy gradient method. So far, so good. You are still with me? Uh, so one question, so will the yeah. RT term, so will that uh, introduce some variance to this? It will, it will. But uh, what I'm trying to do is this. Uh, that's why I, uh, to minimize the variance, I am trying to increase the number of samples. So the greater the n value, the lesser it will be the variance. Okay. So this RT so will work. totally become this. So this will work like with RT if we just sample RT multiple times. Like yes, multiple yes. Times. Okay. Yeah. So because if I sample RT multiple times, I am getting closer and closer to expectation of the RT, right? Okay. Yeah. So which is similar to my Q star of A prime. And and <clears throat> you're trying to sample one arm, or you're basically trying to sample across <laughs> arms here. So this is. Uh, Uh, Sorry, should I repeat? Yeah. So the question is this sampling that you just suggested has to be mm -hmm. done repeatedly for one arm or we have to do it for all the arms? So for one arm, my Q star A prime. So this A prime is for one single arm. So for right. one arm, I need to do N samples. For mm -hmm. arm two, I need to do again N samples. For arm three, I need to do N samples. You get closer and closer to the estimate. But weren't you trying to go away from the value-based uh, concepts? Are you uh, but there is no Q function, right? So in order mm -hmm. to do this, you have to basically uh, do something. Mm -hmm. huh. I'm trying to go away from the value-based method. So you see here, we have not used capital Q, this capital QT, which was the value function estimate, right? We were basically trying to make QT closer and closer to Q star of A. Correct. But so far, we haven't used this capital QT. So how is it different from, so I, that I understand. Mm -hmm. You're still trying to get some rewards and you're trying to do this multiple times. Mm -hmm. So uh, earlier, I, what I was doing is I was trying to optimize the value function. And then I once I have the optimum value function, Hmm. I just do the argmax to get the optimal policy. Correct. So first I do optimal value function. 
then i do optimal policy okay yes. so it's a two shot process hmm. here i am directly dealing with the policy space matlab i take the policy i keep updating it accordingly as we go along okay but, but you still have to do a lot of sampling of r that's true that's true so uh, my policy based methods have some advantages over my value based methods as such like my value based methods cannot deal with continuous actions if you realize sorry i don't understand that if you can repeat that so my bandit is a discrete action right yes yes so i have arm one arm two arm three i pull arm one it's a discrete action mm. let's say when we move to a full all problem so let's say i'm doing autonomous driving i want to uh, my action is how much uh, speed i need to have on an open road or how much steering i need to do so that's mm. a continuous action right mm. so my value based method can never work with the continuous action and the reason being this arg max parameter over here you see this arg max mm -hmm. so if i have a continuous action space how do i do arg max because um you have infinite number of actions exactly exactly i can't do a max right mm. so that's that's one limitation one very strong limitation of a value based method okay Keep understood it. but how does it uh, work in this case then uh, in the case of um, yeah, policy grid um, search how does that so in policy search i still haven't introduced the q value so i haven't had the need so far to do my arg max right mm -hmm. so there is no arg max anywhere i am directly dealing with the policy space so yeah. if i have qt i have to do arg max of that to get my policy right mm okay I, understood but you are still looking to come as close as in on q star a right yes and that would need you to do fair amount of sampling right that's true that's true and if you have to do that in some sense you have to consider this as a discrete entities right don't you am i missing something sorry uh, yeah i yeah, yeah. got got your question at the end of it mm -hmm. because i'm trying to do a sampling so yes, i might have to consider you are sampling mm -hmm. and no but see the question here is uh it still depends on the a prime that i am choosing right so here when i move to continuous action this this summation will be replaced by an integral okay understood right when mm -hmm. we move from discrete to continuous correct so here instead of having this we'll directly integrate this quantity and get some value so that can yeah. always be done correct yeah so you can integrate the part which is the a divided mm -hmm. by b which is policy which is dependent on certain variables that is mm -hmm. but even then when you integrate rt um how would that have, that be just to intuitively understand this if i have to but to integrate rt it uh... so let's say there is some underlying reward distribution okay mm. and i sample i make another sample sample mm. sample 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 mm. and eventually i know that this is my green line correct okay so this is the discrete discrete case yes now for the continuous case so you so just to uh, just to hold you there mm -hmm. you have multiple of these distributions per disc, per action right and this this uh, multiple distribution no no you have one per action right this particular distrib uh, gaussian yes, distribution yes yes for yes. Uh, for the bandit problem for each bandit i have an underlying reward distribution so that, yeah those so are different understood that is so so we are on same page uh, mm -hmm. what have you drawn on the left if i have four arms then you will have four of these distributions correct so this is one such distribution yeah this is one such distribution and you are sampling mm. for each of these okay no 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 wait wait okay i understand your question hmm so i have 
four arms okay hmm. one two three four hmm. okay i am maintaining the q value hmm. okay hmm. in the value based method hmm. so if i uh, not the q value maybe should call it as the reward so i'm maintaining a reward okay hmm. so this is like a sum of the reward okay something hmm. like that hmm. so uh after some number of samples i have this 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 and this hmm. right hmm. for each arm hmm. but let's say i have a continuous space hmm. okay so this is my arm space okay hmm. and this hmm. is again my cumulative reward space hmm. now the distribution looks something like this hmm. based on the based on the uh, small continuous uh, continued hmm. uh, deviation in the action right hmm. now hmm. if i want to figure out this value i need to sample multiple number of times each of the arms yes so if i uh, sample arm 3 hmm. some number of times i hmm. eventually know that i will get my mean somewhere around here let's say my q4 is here so this is my estimation this hmm. blue blue hmm. curve okay hmm. some, some nearby notation hmm. now if i want to estimate this all i need to do is figure out the area under the curve right hmm. Hmm. so that's how do you do that so you sort of you do that riemann uh, riemannian integral right so you break hmm. it down into small small boxes hmm. and you compute the area of this trapezoids hmm. okay so there might be some uh, error because of some part you are leaving but more or less what you will get is uh, the value which is closer to the true expectation mm. so i am trying to figure out the area under the curve over here mm. right so to figure out the area under the curve i need to do an integral instead of a summation understood okay okay so last okay. question this yeah. uh this this thing that you are proposing on the right hand side the um there is some paratomize uh, you are par making a paratomization form of the um, policy policy right mm -hmm. it has some equation i'm assuming some equation right mm -hmm. so it will not have anything on from the value side of it it will be independent of the value parameter yeah yeah okay 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 thank you sir okay okay to uh, come back we had uh, derived this equation okay this equation was derived and know that for this equation i need to do batch updation right now the question is is there a way to improve on that i need i know i don't want to do kind of a batch updation for a single ampule but is there something that we can do better how about we do a single ampule update okay it's a one shot update like i pull a arm i get some reward and i update it on the fly okay so de to deal with that we'll look at an algorithm known as reinforce okay this is an algorithm which is called reinforce so this is a method in which we can do a one or you can say online policy gradient update okay how does it work so we have our theta n plus 1 is theta n plus delta theta n right and my delta theta n is nothing but my alpha n times eta of theta right from the previous slide which is nothing but alpha n times r n times this gradient of pi a comma theta divided by pi of a comma theta correct so far so good now we write it as alpha n r n do by do theta of ln of pi 
एक और मैं डाक ओके सो दिस थिंग हैज बीन रिप्रेजेंटेड बाय दिस क्वांटिटी यू अंडरस्टैंड हाउ इट वर्क्स बिकॉज इफ आई टेक द डेरिवेटिव ऑफ द लॉग फंक्शन सो माय लॉग लॉग एक्स डेरिवेटिव इज वन बाय एक्स एंड इफ आई एम डूइंग द चेन रूल अपडेट इट्स सो इफ आई वांट टू डू लॉग ऑफ लेट्स से थ्री एक्स सो फर्स्ट आई डू द differentiation of log x and then i do the differentiation of 3x and then i multiply it okay so this is uh, a direct consequence of the chain rule of differentiation okay so i write this now i do a small change over here okay so i write it as it is but then i subtract it with some quantity bn okay so this All I'm doing is, I am subtracting my reward with some quantity b of n. So here, my b of n is something I would I call it as my reinforcement baseline. Okay, my reinforcement baseline is independent of theta, so that's why it comes outside of the derivative. <laughs> And if I differentiate it. Uh, as soon as i differentiate it it becomes zero okay because it has no dependence it's a constant scalar quantity okay now the change that i have made here is that by introducing some baseline parameter i am trying to figure out like my reward should be at least better than b of n at least better than bn so that i move in the positive direction if it is uh, lesser than that i move in the negative direction so this uh value of rn if it is greater than some baseline i make a positive update if it's less than some baseline i do a negative update so far so good and and you define this we define this uh, by some heuristic measure okay so one common way to do that is you take the uh, rewards of all the arms independent if it's the optimal arm or not i take the reward of all the arms and i average it so i have like if i have 100 arms i take the average of all the rewards so i get some average reward for the arm pulling so my r of n should be greater than that average okay this is one heuristic but there can be many other heuristic way when wherein we can define this some baseline i mean we want our reward to be better than this okay so it's like if i am driving i need my speed to be greater than 30 km per hour if it is slower than that then it's not a good thing for me so it's some sort of a baseline i need to be better than that okay so uh so so what does it mean if it if it is better or worse mm -hmm. are you not looking to change the policy in such yes we, we are right so we are figuring out theta n if it is worse than that this value becomes negative right so i'll right. move in the negative direction you will go in the negative direction of the gradient yes and what it will change and otherwise you go to the positive side of the gradient correct and the intention is to go to the positive side of the gradient correct so that you maximize it yes okay 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 so that some some baseline i need to be better than that baseline that's all that's all condition that i'm putting okay so this algorithm is known as the reinforce algorithm this update is known as the reinforce algorithm okay so here what the claim is what the author in this paper claims is that in an expected sense the gradient update will be in the right direction okay so earlier we we were uh, skeptical about this part right if we are trying to do a one shot updation we will only get r r of n instead of q star of a right and that will introduce a lot of variance when we are doing the sampling but the author says by introducing this bn 
they prove in the paper that in an expected sense the gradient update will more or less be in the right direction so this is uh, the important conclusion of this paper that even though we might not need to do some sort of a batch update we can still be expected to move in the right direction the variance will still be there but eventually we'll uh, end up going in the right direction okay so this is the main idea behind this so the convergence here is very very slow because of the increased variance so my reward convergence here instead of having a smoother convergence like we saw in the case of the epsilon greedy it will be very messy like there will be lot of variance lots of up and down ups and downs but eventually it will converge okay so this is the uh, main intuition behind the reinforce algorithm okay so and, now and by introducing this bn this variations will decrease is it no no variance will still be there will be there right? yeah it will be there so they are not claiming that uh, their method will give the result in the fastest possible way but it's still a one shot updation compared to the batch updation that we are doing so i pull an arm i get some reward and i update the policy it's a single mm. shot updation that i'm doing correct yeah so this is the main advantage of this paper okay just so, last, uh, sorry just last yeah, question yeah, sure. at the end of all of what we do when we have reached the apex of that curve we mm -hmm. would have identified a a, a probability <laughs> distribution for the reward so for, for for amongst so that will give me an understanding that amongst all the uh, different um, actions which one is the highest probability and which is the lowest probability is that what correct it correct yes yes hmm. in in the context of bandit yes it will tell me that so let's say there is a true reward here okay this is like the true reward for arm a yeah you call it like q star of a and this is my capital q t of a based on that reward we are trying to get closer and closer to q star of a this is yeah. what so my, the, i mean by but it will be a probability distribution for all actions right probability so at the end when, of it when, when i say there is this a policy a huh. policy is nothing but a probability distribution for all actions right At correct, the end, at, at the end of this exercise, whatever I mm -hmm. you have explained here, I yeah. will get the best probability distribution for what I want to do. Correct, correct. Right? So you get a policy for act arm A. You get a policy yes. for arm. Yes. So yes. do you do you say that I have a policy for arm A and arm B differently, or do you yes, say yes. I have a policy? Which oh, okay, okay. So my question is: a policy policy is a policy distribution for all the actions, or is it for <laughs> a specific action? so that's where the generalization comes in right so whenever we are trying to deal with rl so we don't want each action to be a certain policy because okay eventually eventually we want to go to continuous action space right yes so when we have a continuous action space then we can't define that thing so it's like a joint distribution it's like a distribution over all the actions so basically when you say there's a policy what it's the saying? probability it's the probability of selecting action a at time t and also a probability of action a dash at time t correct yes yes so if 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 i have five arms at the end of it a policy tells me what is the probability the best i select probability. arm four ha among the four which one should i take what's the highest probability what is the second highest what's the third yes, highest yes 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 that is yes. what a probability mean uh, sorry that's what a policy, policy. Yes, yes okay thanks a lot it helped me yeah 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 okay so so far we have been looking at the bandit problem okay one last thing before we close off the bandit problem is something known as contextual bandits okay remember in the bandit uh, problem it was an immediate rl problem i pull an arm i get a reward there was no notion of a state space okay it's like each arm pull was independent it's, sim it's similar to a coin toss example if i toss a coin the next coin toss is independent of the previous coin toss similarly if i pull an arm i get a reward i forget i move on to the next arm okay so there is no notion of a context in 
in all the arm pulls that we have seen so far right so this contextual bandit is like some sort of an extension okay so what you are trying to do is from the bandit problem we start off with the bandit problem and our aim is to eventually go to the full rl problem right so my contextual bandit lies somewhere between okay so you can think of it as some sort of a bridge okay that connects the bandit problem to the full rl problem i mean not exactly a bridge it will connecting but it's an extension of the uh, bandit problem <laughs> but it's again exactly not the full rl problem okay so for the multi arm bandit problem so for the mab problem mab stands for multi arm bandit what we have is we have action based on which we get a reward right now for the contextual bandit problem what we are trying to do is we are sort of relaxing the no state assumption in bandit problem okay so this is something that we are doing with contextual bandit so again similar to that we will have an action we will have a reward but we will also have a state here okay that gives some sort of a context to that particular action and my reward is kind of a uh, giving a feedback loop of how my state should look like okay so based on the state i have a state action based on that i get a reward and there is a feedback loop <coughs> which uh, uh, tells me on how to make my decision or how to take action based on what state i'm currently at okay so uh, this is the contextual bandit problem so what is still missing for it to make uh, comp to be identified as a full rl problem is that there is no uh, sequential dependence okay so i just take a state i do an action i get a reward that's it i don't have like a state action state action state action reward so i get state action reward then next state next action next reward and so on so in a full rl problem there is also a state action sequence that is keep keep on happening okay so you have state action reward state action reward so it's like a full uh, trajectory that you are building so that is still missing in the contextual bandit that's why it's still very much a bandit problem but with some additional constraint okay <laughs> some example for a contextual bandit problem okay so you can uh, think of it like it's again the multi arm bandit problem but it's like uh, many many different different types of bandits are there so many many different varieties of the multi arm bandit is there and based on what kind of people come in based on some uh, grouping i say okay this person will play this set of bandit problem the second person will play this sort of bandit problem and so on okay so i am taking some sort of a grouping or some sort of a context of that person into account one example is uh, something uh like online advertising okay so amazon if you are if you shop on amazon you have 10 different product listings okay if i click on a particular product i get some reward if i don't click on that i get a negative reward okay now amazon collects data of each individual so based on uh my recent uh browser history or my recent purchase history and so on uh i get advertised uh, the contents uh, or the uh, products which are similar to what i have uh, seen so far so 
based on that context i am uh, shown only those 10 products which are relevant to me okay so it is taking into account my browsing history my preferences my previous purchase history and so on so that's there secondly uh, second example could be uh, your recommender system so if you are watching a youtube video or something so let's say you type reinforcement learning and my video comes up so if you have subscribed to my channel uh, based on that subscription you will get 10 more videos okay of different different uh, reinforcement learning tutorials and so on another example could be uh, can you think of another example where it's a banded problem with some additional constraint with some additional information so far i have mentioned online advertising i have mentioned recommend your system so recommendation system is sort of general okay so if you go to facebook twitter or other any other such places based on what you have uh, uh looked at so far the algorithm uh gives you uh content accordingly okay one could be say personalized medicine okay so for a doctor each patient is similar to a bandit okay so the doctor wants to cure you so based on your previous history your past history and so on uh they'll prescribe you medicine which is apt for you okay so this is another such example maybe something like chatbots okay for example chat gpt you pro as as you keep on providing it more and more context it tries to refine its uh results right so this is about the contextual bandit problem i think uh, we are clear with what is contextual bandit right so it's similar to the bandit but having a state parameter okay so if this is clear we want to move on to the full rl problem now okay so what the contextual bandit problem was missing the full rl problem kind of makes up for it right so in full rl we have some agent we have some some environment okay so some trees there okay so the agent takes some action the environment returns the next state as a result of that action and based on that it also evaluates the action taken by the agent by means of a reward function okay so you can think of it like so you have that's a state s of t here you take action at get reward rt plus 1 go to state st plus 1 okay similarly you take action at plus 1 get reward rt plus 2 reach state st plus 2 so on until you reach some s of capital t which is some terminal state okay so you see there is some sequence which is there so you need to have some state action state action so you need to <coughs> perform uh, or perform a sequence of actions in order to reach the ultimate goal okay and this reward function is uh, basically telling me how good a particular action taken was which is uh, already encoded in the environment so the agent doesn't get a reward by itself the reward is something which is always given to it by the environment okay so it's 
outside the direct, direct context uh, contact of the agent here. So this is the reward function. Similarly, my policy is pi t a given s. So now my action uh, earlier my policy was pi t of a. Now my uh, action is conditioned on the state. Okay, it's a conditional probability given state s. What action I should take? So this translate as probability of me taking action A at time t given I am at state S at time t. Okay. And in most RL problem that we'll be dealing with in this course, we'll say that the policy is stationary. Okay. That means my pi of one is equal to pi of two. So I remove this notion of time from here so that the policy that I have seen uh, or that we see will be stationary. We don't deal with non-stationary policy, at least in this course. OK, can I ask you a few questions? If you do? Sure, sure. Now, uh, this is something I always get confused with. When you mm -hmm. said pi t, your first statement pi t a uh, given s, given s hmm. if you were to go with that definition, mm -hmm. uh, what would it mean? It would mean that state 1, state 2, state 3, have different actions and the probability distribution of each of these different actions will be different. Is that what it would be? Yes. So you have state S1. Yeah. You can have three different actions. Yes. You can go to, let's say, state S2 prime, S2 double prime. Yes. S2 triple prime by yes. taking action A1 prime, A1 double prime, and A1 triple prime. OK. OK. So this policy tells me if I'm at state S, what is the probability of me selecting action A1 prime, action A1 double prime, and action A1 triple prime? So that is a policy at state S1. Yes. That policy at state S2 could be entirely different. It could have only one action, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so if you don't mind, can you extend the diagram? S2 mm -hmm. might, might have only maybe one two action. action. Maybe just one two. Action. OK. Now, so this is different from the policy at state S1 because S1 had three actions. Here we have two actions. And the policy in S1 would define the probability distributions for three different actions. In S2, the probability would define the probability distribution uh, for two different actions. And all mm -hmm. these actions may or may not be different, correct? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Now, when you say pi 1 is equal to pi 2 is equal to pi, what are you mm -hmm. suggesting that? All of them will have the same actions and the same number of no, actions. No, no, no. I am saying that if at time t equal to 1, I am at state S1, the probability of me selecting action A1 prime, A1 double prime, and A3 double prime remains same even if I come back to it at time, let's say, time is equal to 1000. Oh, it means that if I come back to S1 subsequently, mm -hmm. probability distribution of A1, A2, uh, the probability of my accepting a1 yeah dash a1 double dash or a1 <clears throat> that remains constant yes yes it doesn't take away f this thing that you have shown here that i still mm -hmm. might have s2 having only two actions with a different probability distribution that's fine that's fine the probability distribution that's why is condition on state right mm. so, <laughs> so you are saying that's if i come back to s1 uh, the mm -hmm. probability distributions for A1, A1 dash, A1 triple dash remain constant. It remains constant. This is called stationary policy. This is called stationary policy. Okay. Now I understand. When we have, when we have a non-stationary policy, so let's say if I am going from here to my office, if it's there is no traffic, I might take some uh, easier route. If there is traffic, I might need to take some other route. Okay. Mm. So that's how my policy changes with time. But mm -hmm. here we... At least uh, in this course, we will rarely be dealing with non-stationary policy. Okay. So one, two, and three, and four of your pi is actually time one, time x, mm. time y, which is but yes. for the same yes. state for the same state. Yes, yes. Okay. For the same action, state action pair. For the same action pair, understood. Okay. State, Thank state action pair. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Understood. Thanks a lot. Okay. Okay.
maybe i uh, finish the returns part and then we can call it a day it will take me 5 minutes so we have defined the policy now we define something known as returns so my returns is defined as my g of t is r of t plus 1 plus r of t plus 2 plus dot 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 till i reach my terminal state r of t so it's saying if i am at time t i might have gotten some reward my return tells me what reward i can expect to get if i start from time t starting from time t what is the expected future reward that i can get that's what my return quantity tells me okay so this is known as total return so what i'm doing is i'm trying to optimize so that i maximize my long term uh, future reward okay so if i maximize this individual quantity or this individual quantity so it might happen that other quantities may have some lower values or uh, they uh, i mean if i independently try to maximize this this quantities so i am trying to behave greedily okay i am just trying to look one step ahead and try to maximize that quantity but all i care is even if rt plus 1 is smaller rt plus 2 should be subsequently larger so that my total summation of this is is maximized okay so this is what we mean by return so when i say i am trying to maximize my return i am always looking at the long term future reward okay similarly there is another notation or uh, another type of return known as discounted return so here i just introduce a gamma parameter okay and this goes on so this is known as discounted return and my gamma is always between 0 and 1 <laughs> this is like okay so what it tells me is that i am trying to give a higher weightage to my closest return as compared to my future return okay that means uh the closer uh the rewards which are closer in time should have a higher value than something which comes much later in time okay so this gamma parameter since it is less than 1 so my rt plus 2 would have a lower weightage then my rt plus 3 will have similarly another uh, subsequently lower weightage and so on okay so this discount parameter kinds of gives me a tuning between how far sighted or how near sighted i want to be when i want to uh, look at my reward okay or you can say it's something like immediate okay you can say it's something like immediate gratification versus a delayed gratification okay so this is another uh, type one more uh, type of return that sir had mentioned was this quantity wherein we have r t plus 1 plus r t plus 2 plus dot 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 till r t plus n so we take uh, the return over some finite quantities we sum it over all the n and divide it by 1 by n okay so this gives us some kind of an average uh, average return setting that means over some finite time uh, time period i am trying to find out the return i try to average over it okay so note that this is again similar to the total return just that i am dividing by it by 1 by n term but now the question comes what if 
i don't know my n okay what if my capital n becomes uh very very large so i take limit as n tends to infinity okay so i apply a limit term over here as well so uh you see uh with the total return and the average return based on whatever type of reward that we are selecting uh it doesn't necessarily affect the policy decision making right because uh by definition if i uh if i take in all the reward sum it over no matter what changes i do it my policy still remains the same right but compare it with the discounted reward kind of a setup okay so this example that sir had given in class i'm just writing it down so let's say there are three states one is earth there is heaven and there is hell okay to transition from earth to heaven you get a reward of minus 100 to transition from earth to hell you get a reward of plus 1000 but once you reach here for infinite time you get a reward of plus 1 and here for infinite time you get a reward of minus 1 <laughs> okay so now based on how i tune my uh, gamma parameter okay the gamma parameter tells me how far i want to look into the future so if my gamma is high i might choose an action which here gives me minus 100 but eventually i'll get infinite plus ones right so having a higher value of gamma would uh, eventually help me selecting the action which uh, selecting the policy which takes me to heaven okay otherwise if my gamma is very very low so i am trying to look more closely uh, i am i am trying to give more importance to the action which are immediate right so i am more inclined to take that action which will take me to hell and eventually i'll end up getting minus 1 minus 1 minus 1 uh, for perpetuity okay so depending on the tuning of the gamma parameter my policy changes completely right which was not the case with my total return and my average return so whenever we take in the discounted return so you can understand that the discounted return is something which is uh, applicable to a real life situation right so i am more likely to take an action which will give me some immediate gratification but later on uh, i am also trying to keep a long term uh, long term return uh, uh in my mind before i take that but whatever is immediate should have a higher weightage compared to something which is which will happen in uh further time steps okay so based on the uh tuning of the gamma parameter now Paul, so my gamma kind of affects the policy right so the gamma needs to be tuned so this is another parameter that we have uh, looked at so for the returns we have introduced another term gamma so based on the tuning of the gamma our policy uh, differs right so i think it's uh, already time we can stop it here i one question i have now yeah. uh, it is related to policy gradient sorry i was not in between mm -hmm. uh, sure, sure, sure. so for like in policy gradient we are introducing a baseline right so if our reward is greater than this baseline we are actually giving it more weightage compared to reward that are less than this baseline yeah so my uh, so this is in turn helping us to reduce the variance in the kind area. of yes yes so so if like so the point of baseline is to reduce the variance in the uh, this given somewhat case. somewhat yes and, and so this yeah yeah so this paper actually proves that by introducing a baseline Yeah. it's not it's not helping reducing the variance but with the help of this baseline we can sort of prove that the gradient update will mean the correct direction even though it is uh well, the variance is uh, still high but hmm. eventually you will go to the correct direction okay and if i don't use a baseline then also i will end up in a uh, same solution or that will lead to a different solution because of the more variance uh 
so that's why we need some baseline right because if not if we go here so even instead of doing some batch updation if i do a random if i do a uh, select a random uh, arm and i get a reward so yeah. what if the reward is on the lower end of the spectrum right so if uh, my reward distribution mm -hmm. it has a true optimal value which is very very high but because i am doing a stochastic sampling i end up getting a value which is at the lower tail right yes so that means that because of that i would uh, update my policy uh, so as to give a negative uh, negatively based on that particular ample but it might be a good ample but because of a single ample i have uh, penalized it right yeah okay so this baseline sort of helps mitigate that so if i have some heuristic baseline so i say that okay the average reward of the bandit is some particular value mm -hmm. if my reward is greater than that then i move in the positive direction if it's less than that i move in the negative direction so this helps mitigate that problem that i showed previously okay okay thank you okay so just one question if you can go to the statement that you made on policy just yeah wait here uh, yeah. no sir the next one sir here sorry sir next one the policy statement that you had for full hour yeah the here one sir so mm -hmm. again if you don't mind pi t is 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 a particular policy for a particular state at a time t is that how one should learn this policy is basically a mapping from a state to action given state s so it is and, so it is only mm -hmm. for one specific state no not really so no, the policy so, so when you yeah. when you define it the way you have defined it pi mm -hmm. t a of s the t yeah. the t here is what it means coming back in sub subsequent iterations correct yeah policy t, at time t policy at time t but for mm -hmm. the state s correct for state s now if i have in your example i have four states mm -hmm. and if i have to define this complete setup then i have mm -hmm. to define four distinct policies no 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 so the policy is uh mm -hmm. policy is just a, a measure right on how you assign a probability the policy is like a probability so here my a1 prime a2 prime and a3 prime they get assigned some probability correct on which action i need to take right correct. so this probability assignment so this a transition probability what you call right for state s1 correct no transition probability is for the entire environment actually is it okay yeah so so this is uh, something known as an mdp hmm mdp stands for mark of decision process so hmm. you have a particular state you can select some number of actions hmm usually what happens in an mdp is that you also have a transition probability hmm that means if i am at status i select hmm. action this what is the probability i'll select action this to go to next state or something like that Correct. but in a in a reinforcement learning problem in a real life rl problem mm -hmm. we don't have this transition probability with us right mm -hmm. we no, we can't I, say right i understand that but huh? the word policy is per state is it correct to say that no 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 so depending on each state in your example s1 mm. had three different action s2 had only two actions mm. so when i have to specify the the policy in the context of s1 and its probability distributions for each of the actions would it not be different from what i have to specify for s2 where the actions are only two and the probability distributions will only be for those two actions okay so my probability distribution is kind of a joint distribution okay so this is my state space capital s this is my action space capital a so the policy that i have is some sort of a joint distribution over the entire state space and the action space so to answer your question so for state s1 i for each so 
let's say for state s1 this is for state s1 this is uh, some state in the state space so this line corresponds to that right mm -hmm. for state s1 mm -hmm. so based on that so for actions a1 a2 a3 on the action space i'll get three different values based on this distribution right correct as part of this distribution now if i change state s2 i'll get another line yeah based on which i'll get some different probability yeah. so what i'm trying to learn is entire joint distribution so even though a1 dash a1 double dash and a1 triple dash are hmm. not in the context of s2 i will still have value 000, 000, 000 for them yeah sure because see if you look at this distribution here for s2 so, only for a, s2 a, only a2 dash and a2 double dash will have probability some non zero yeah. probabilities for other actions yeah. will have zero probabilities sure yeah is that how because this is yes yes so this a1 here is outside this joint distribution right for s2 for s2 hmm. a1 is outside the joint distribution but for s1 this lies inside okay maybe i haven't drawn it like that hmm. but yeah something like this understood understood so you're <laughs> saying each state <laughs> The, it's a it's a it's a it is a Just definition which will help me identify what are the action probabilities for all of them and mm -hmm. some of them will be zero and some will be non-zero mm -hmm. but they all sum up to one all sum up some to all sum yeah. up to one. but in mm -hmm. our case in the example that you have drawn a2 dash and a2 dash double dash will be equal to sum up to one if the, no, and the others will be all zero the others will yes go. yes yes Okay, thank you so much. I, <laughs> because this is a little difficult for me to understand. Yes, yes. Sure, sure. So uh, now you are clear, right? So what yeah. I'm trying to learn is a, some sort of a joint distribution. Ah, you're learning a, because every time I was I was hmm. thinking that in all the literature that you saw hmm. as mentioned and you are also mentioning, I mm -hmm. thought there should be a distinction of defining a policy for each state specifically, which is not the right thing. Correct. When I Correct. say that I am looking for a optimum policy which is also something sir talks about mm -hmm. it is a joint probability of everything and being optimal in the context of the, all the states involved correct correct okay thank you so much i think that clears yeah. up a lot of stuff yes yes will you continue this for next time or will you move to the yes next? yes next yes time? yes i'll continue i'll continue with the uh, value function i think that's important and then uh, we can uh, we'll start with the uh, uh, week for bellman optimality okay uh, part okay so I think week four has a lot of proofs and stuff. So maybe we can have a broader look instead of going deeper into the proof. Sure. So if you want, uh, there are two more TAs. So we, we are actually three TAs. We all are having different backgrounds. So I have a background in physics. The other TA has a background in CS. One other TA has a background in math. So you can try attending uh, their tutorial session. So to get different perspective. Okay. So. They might explain it from a different point of view. My sure. explanation is from a different point of view. Sure. But yeah. So yeah, that's it. That's all I had to say. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So very nice. Thank you. Thank you for attending. Uh, I'll see you next week then. Okay. I'll stop the recording. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you.